think just on, on a background to, to these particular position papers, we've been working on the issue of state capture and parry for a long time. We hosted a big conference last year, um, inviting people from, from across civil society to come and talk about some of the most important issues that, that we had to address. And I think based on what happened at that conference and on our research work, we identified three key areas um, of state reform that we thought we could, we could start by addressing. And we by no means say that these are the only issues that need to be addressed, but this is where we have started. And those were appointments and dismissals in the, in the public service, uh, state procurement, and appointments and dismissals in um, the justice cluster. And what we wanted to do with this is we were very clear that we didn't want these just to be carry research outputs that we developed on our own and then and then published. Instead, what we wanted to do is we wanted to develop them in partnership with as broad a social civil society coalition as we could, getting as much input from people as we could, so that we could end up with proposals that were jointly owned by a, a wide group of people. So we went through. Um, a fairly extensive process which has brought us to today. We developed initial <coughs> draft proposals, we invited readers um, to, to make input, and then we had further discussions with civil society organizations about what the content of those proposals should be. We also consulted with people within the state. We've had some fairly senior consultations with, with people um, in the Department of Public Service and Administration, in the Presidency, in SELGA, in, in National Treasury. I think we really see that these proposals, which are, are still in some kind of draft stage, as um, the collective product of a partnership. We believe very strongly that civil society needs to work in, in stronger partnerships moving forward to effect this reform. So what we're going to do is we're going to present very briefly the content of each of those reforms. There's much more detail in the individual papers. I'm going to be talking about um, recruitment and dismissals. Um, Florencia is going to be talking about uh, the justice cluster, and then um, Prof. Jonathan Clarin from WITS is going to be talking about um, public sector um, procurement. So, sorry, this is not. So, I think when we have a look at what the problem is in, in, in the public service, the problem is that for historical reasons, there's an awful lot of political discretion in not just the appointment of people in, in key positions across the public service, but also in terms of the way in which those public servants are disciplined and are dismissed. And this discretion, which was put in place to make sure that the new civil service would comply with the new policy objectives of the ANC led government is regularly abused to facilitate patronage and the extract, extraction of, of, of public resources. And because we don't have checks and balances on this political um, discretion, we have a significant problem with unstrung people being appointed into key positions. So we have a strong mismatch between the capacity that's required in the state and the people that are actually being appointed to the state. The politicization of the workplace and factionalization within the workplace creates distorted incentives in the organization. So we have institutions that with a significant number of people are not working towards the stated goals of the institution, but are in fact working towards some other kind um, of agenda. And then the, the very strong role of political discretion means that the authority of administrative heads in departments is often undermined. So, we're not the only country that is experiencing it, and I think it's important for us to point out that we've identified the problem as the unchecked political power in this regard. We are not saying that there should be no political discretion in the appointment of senior public servants. In every country, there is an element of that. But the question is, how do we strike a balance between that political discretion and making sure that we get the most capable public service um, that we can? And that means that we need to begin to construct checks and balances on the ability of politicians to do appointments. So basically, what our proposals are about is about putting in place some kind of generic process of appointments. And there we've recommended that this is implemented across a unitary public service that would include national, provincial, and local government. Um, and essentially what it would mean is we set clear criteria for each position, 
and that there is an independent process to ensure that only candidates who meet those criteria requirements are in fact shortlisted and are able to be appointed into, into those positions. This is this process administration. And this is what would stand between um, the ability of politicians <coughs> to simply appoint anyone um, and making sure that you have a group of people for the job. And then from that shortlisting, politicians would have to choose candidates from, from those shortlisted um, people and not be able to appoint people outside of that. So there's obviously going to be a great deal of variation in how this is done at a national, provincial and municipal um, level. Um, the important feature and one that we highlighted in our papers is that we can't do all of this at once. We cannot put in place a brand new process for the appointment of senior people across three spheres of government and simply implement it tomorrow. The administrative outcomes of that are, are, are just too horrible to contemplate. So what we've suggested in the paper is that what we do is we have something that's been used in the United States, it's called a covering in clause. So what we do is we have legislation and that different parts of the state can be covered in at different times. So we could start with where we say, oh, the most serious problems, and we would apply to those institutions, and so we would unroll it. And once a particular institution of the state has been covered in, then cannot, um, that, that cannot be changed. You cannot then go back um, and change the process that, that is in there. Um, so we also believe that that would be the lowest cost way of, of doing it. We'd have to think about the institutional arrangements we would have to to influence this, who would be the organization that decides on the shortlist and, and those things. But we believe that the proposals provide a very good start for starting to think about how we can change the nature of appointments, dismissals, and disciplinary in the public sector. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the second thematic paper that we've done, which is the appointment and removals in key criminal justice system institutions. And uh, again, the rationale for that is that um, the reason that we are focusing particularly around these institutions um, is that the I mean, the criminal justice system we, we've heard today uh, certainly it's been a pillar of the democratic state and it's, we need it. We need the criminal justice to work well if we want the rule of law and respect for the constitution. Um, unfortunately though, during the last decade, our criminal justice system has been subject to significant political manipulation. Um, there's been political interference in, in appointment and removal processes, um, which undermines these institutions, erodes principles of democracy, the rule of law, and also enables further patronage. Um, also, I think the issue of um, unchecked, if we call it, or improper political interference has also systematically eroded the public trust that we have in many of these institutions as they've come to serve party needs, party factions, and not the public. And also, this interference has enabled impunity, right? So that we don't see prosecutions for those who should be prosecuted, resources that should be devoted to investigations or not, investigations are thwarted. We see increases in particular kinds of crime. Certainly the ISS has done a lot of work on this. And therefore there is indeed a need to re-establish the legitimacy, impartiality, and the independence of these institutions. And. Um, so in terms of the proposals that we are looking at, and, um, as Tracy said, I mean, there's a number of um, civil society organizations that have done quite a bit of work in this area already. So as we said, these are not parry proposals. The idea is to get a coalition, a, a group of organizations that, and individuals and interested people who want to take this fight forward and make sure that many of these things get instituted. Um, Okay, so this is the third set of um, three slides in this presentation. My name is Jonathan Claren. I work at the University of the Big Father's Front. I've been working with Perry on this topic of public procurement reform for about three or four years. We started off doing a little bit of consulting with the OCPO um, and then brought through the process that Tracy was describing of partnering and workshopping these proposals with some of the other um, civil society partners. 
Um, so each of these papers, um, in our case, there's a 9,000 word paper that's available uh, on the Perry website, which you're getting only the three slides uh, here. So the three slides are um, talking about the background, the causes, and then some proposals for reform and public procurement. So, and we think it's part of the way Perry goes about it is actually looking at the history in order to figure out where we go in the future. But um, in public procurement, breaking down from apartheid's classically centralized procurement system, which favored large, large firms, although also within those large firms, long-term relationships, it must be said, and obviously racially biased. Um, Post-94, those tender boards centralized were broken up. Effectively, the managerial powers were devolved. Um, explicit preferential procurement was put into the Constitution and into the system as a leverage for um, advancing, um, addressing historical discrimination, um, but also as part of the system of um, procurement. An initial movement there in the regulation system towards standard setting, monitoring, and enforcement. The, the scale of public procurement in South Africa, as well as elsewhere, is huge. Um, it's got an increasing significance within government operation and politics, as we know. Um, and we've realized that, um, really, uh, the, the role of information, data, and transparency is very important here. Good data is actually scarce within government, as well as outside. Um, but we can say that these problems um, here are non-compliance, corruption, and effectively in a, uh, operational inability or certainly <coughs> not as well as would be desired to secure the good services of quality on time and in the right place. Um, causes, lack of professionalization, political interference, lack of enforcement, um, lack of capacity in the sense of capable, skilled procurement personnel in appropriate units. Um, another cause as an excessively complicated <coughs> fragmented and inconsistent, at times, legal regime. I know a good judge can work out um, you know, the consistency, but um, it's got to work for everyone. Um, and arguably, an uh, incorrect balance between the procedural integrity and operational deliberate, delivery. Um, that's about, effectively, too much rules and maybe not enough flexibility. Um, also, uh, we've identified a mismatch between no, lack of alignment or match between the current process and strategic or development of objectives. So in other words, getting the procurement um, system to speak more to, for instance, um, planning and budgeting and strategy um, processes we need to So proposals, I won't go through those all, um, three of them. I think it's fair to say that when we started our work, we were more focused on legislation, but it partly in uh, conversation with the other uh, civil society partners, we really took a step back from that and realized that legislative reform is really only to be one part of the puzzle here. It's really a broader institutional issue. Uh, so there are lots of proposals, but some good places to start are on the data transparency. Uh, there's recommendation there to National Treasury, a couple to OCPO. Um, also, really, for more study and actually Yes, we do come from a university, a place for research here um, as part of the movement toward developing a business case for developing and monitoring the system. Um, uh, in terms of the statutory reform, we feel that that can be done um, based on the Constitution, Section 217, which lays out um, principles, um, but to work to simplify, cohere, and make more flexible the regime, and also to be addressing uh, the existing sector stat statutes and regimes in procurement. So as many of you will know who work in this area, there are particular procurement regimes, let's say IT, construction, etc. So the legislative reform actually has to address uh, how the general addresses the specific. Um, last point, the Quitam is a whistleblower uh, enforcement scheme which has got um, some real traction in uh, some other jurisdictions. Uh, I was looking at the manifesto that this conference would be um, considering later, talking about whistleblowers. I think what's important is, and we've already heard about whistleblowers, uh, is that 
We're suggesting here a way of institutionalizing whistleblowers to actually use that information as part of, incent uh, as part of enforcement within the reform of the public procurement system. So it's not merely kind of encouraging them, it's actually, uh, there's got to be real work of training in institutions to use that information in order to uh, enforce uh, the rules of the system. That was five minutes. Was it? Thank you to my colleagues and good afternoon everyone. I'd like to invite and introduce Mr. Corley George as well as Deputy Minister John Jeffrey. <coughs> As they're coming up, I'll just introduce them. So, Deputy Minister John Jeffrey has served as South Africa's Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development since July 2013. Mr. Jeffrey is an admitted attorney and holds BA and LLB degrees, as well as a postgraduate diploma in environmental law from the University of KwaZulu Natal. Mr. Jeffrey has been a member of the National Assembly of Parliament since 1999. He is a former member of the Justice and Constitutional Development Portfolio Committee and has served as Parliamentary Counselor to the President and the Deputy President from 1999 until July 2013. He has been a member of Parliament for the African National Congress since 1999 and also a member of the ANC National Executive Committee, the Legislative and Governance Subcommittee, and the ANC Political <coughs> Committee in Parliament. Welcome, Deputy Minister. Mr. Tolile George is the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Local Government Association, an autonomous organization mandated by the Constitution that defines SALGA as a representative of local government. Salga, with a membership of 278 municipalities nationally, interfaces with Parliament, the National Council of Provinces, Cabinet, as well as provincial legislatures. Mr. George's experience in policy, legislation, systems and program implementation at local, provincial and national level spans over 20 years and is supported by a robust academic background. He holds a master's degree in development economics, an executive MBA, and several postgraduate diplomas and management certificates. Mr. George serves on several boards locally and internationally. Welcome, Mr. George. I think we should start with a reflection on the presentation that we've just had. So, I'll start with you, Deputy Minister. What initiatives are there in government to address some of the proposals for state reform that have just been presented? Thanks very much. Um, the light is the RK okay, now it's working. Uh, just a quick disclaimer while I sit in front of um, my NEC leader, um, Derek Hunnick, <laughs> I'm not a member of the never have been a member of the ANC NEC. I've sat on NEC subcommittees, so I think that was the, the issue. Look, I think this is an important debate. Um, there isn't really, uh, that I'm aware of within government, um, that much structured discussion on, on some of the changes. I, I can't really speak for the procurement aspect, there may be more there, but on the appointments uh, to the criminal justice system, which I'm obviously more familiar with, uh, there's not really any structured uh, discussion. I think it is important, though, uh, for this matter to be debated because it is complicated. And just if I can start by running through, and it would be partially a, a, a response. Um, in 94, uh, and I was in the case of the provincial legislature, but uh, I think there was a tendency from both the legislatures and parliament to more carefully prescribe the powers that ministers had had over appointment. Uh, and so you, you saw Parliament being given a role in the appointment of boards and bodies that ministers normally would have just appointed on their own. Um, from the provincial legislature side, we were much more prescriptive. I remember the uh, legislation creating uh, KZN Wildlife as in Velo, uh, specifying 
different categories of people that had to be appointed on the board. Um, I, I think firstly with Parliament, it, it was probably not necessary for Parliament to play a role in, in some of these more minor structures. And in specifying, if it's a 10-person committee, what the categories or the criteria of each of the 10 people um, doesn't leave much space for flexibility. So to some extent, I think it was a bit of, of over-regulation. On the issues of the appointment in the criminal justice system, um, I'm, I'm speaking a bit longer, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I mean, the law is basically open. President appoints, uh, generally, fit and proper person. It's, it's very broad. Um, Every, um, uh, let's take the National Director of Public Prosecutions, every NDPP apart from the current one was just appointed by the President without any, any process. Uh, in the beginning, um, the first, one, two, three, uh, four, um, the first four were not members of the prosecuting authority and had no experience. It was only then, um, in the case of Sean Abrahams, that, that you had somebody who had some or who was within the prosecuting authority. And what was interesting with the current appointment, I think all the people interviewed, I think, were either in the NPA or had been in the NPA. Uh, so just indicating that as a, as, a, as, a, as a fact. I mean, obviously, transformation needs were different in the beginning. But I think the, the process for the appointment of the NDPP um, is, in a sense, uh, turned out to be a model of, of I think, best practice. Um, the one change that was not envisaged, and I'm looking, but he's not looking at me, at Mr. McKinley here, over there, uh, was the, the, public, uh, in, the public participatory process of, of publicizing the, uh, not the, yeah, sorry, publicizing the, the, the interviews. Um, when Wright you know, brought that application, the president, as far as I recall, did not oppose it. Uh, and I think it was quite a useful element. The result then was they sent five names. Um, and I think there was general national consensus on not that Shamila Batoy was the only one, but on, on a number of people had seen the people being interviewed. I was speaking earlier to Edward uh, Kisveter, um and uh, comparing his appointment process. Now, equally um, with the SARS commissioner in the past, uh, it was just the minister who, or president who appointed. Um, in, in his case, it was again a panel set up. The difference though was, uh, Dale, was that there was no public, uh, um, the public couldn't see the interviews. So hence, he's got problems of, of EFF saying no, this was a conspiracy, a cabal. Um, nobody, as far as I have heard, has said anything wrong about or that there was anything untoward in the appointment of Shamila Latoy. And I do think, so I do think that the, the, the public, um, uh, the public being able to see the interviews was important. Obviously a drawback is, is that um, um, there may be questions, more sensitive questions like that you may want to ask the SARS commissioner as to what methods are you going to put in place to catch uh, tax dodgers that you don't want uh, the public and, and therefore the tax dodgers to, to hear about. So there are some arguments, um, but, but I, I, I do think that turned out to be uh, a model of, of, of good practice. Um, do you want me to go on to removals or do you want me to wait for you? I think wait. Okay. All right, sure, okay. okay. So, Mr. George, can we just get your reflection on what initiatives there are in government to address some of the proposals that were presented? particularly with regards to local government appointments and dismissals. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Facilitator. Good afternoon. Uh, I think uh, on my side, uh, looking at the presentation around uh, proposals to strengthen the recruitment processes, management processes, and how the political uh, leadership interfaces with the administration, they are quite uh, commendable, all of them. I do, however, think that there is no absence of measures similar to those that are contained in the paper. They are all there. 
And what perhaps is lacking is strengthening on the area of professionalization of uh, the institutions in terms of municipality, processes, the recruitment of people, because they stated intention what to look at and this is what comes into the organization. There's quite a lot of challenges around that at the municipal level. And I think one of the areas that are outlined there, I will cite three examples. Around 2010, there was a very comprehensive review of the state of local government. And uh, many of you who may be in the in government and, and general civil society, perhaps you would know there was a report called Local Government Turnaround Strategy. And it covered quite a whole range of areas that complicate governance and government at municipal level. And one of the key areas that it proposed was around areas of uh, reforms that must be done around legislation that gov governs how a municipality is run. And it's normally referred to as a municipal systems act. So 2011, there was an amendment that was quite comprehensive around what are the minimum requirements for anyone to be employed as managers in particular, what are the disciplinary process to be done, who must be involved and how the process of recruitment must be done, and the oversight around those areas, including remuneration systems and performance system. So a number of regulations, 2012, 2013, 2014, were all introduced. However, that legislation, whilst it was implemented, it experienced quite a lot of challenges. Uh, one, in terms of inordinate amount of delays on those who are entrusted with oversight, and secondly, it also experienced unevenness in the implementation. In fact, people blatantly disregarded uh, the rules with lesser consequences uh, around that area. But however, it suffered a bit of a, a heavy blow where it was uh, struck off um, by the Constitutional Court uh, recently on the 9th of March 2019. So effectively, we do not have those measures. They were about ensuring that people who are holders of political office cannot be in the administration of municipalities. People who aspire to get into public office, when IEC runs processes, they must be out, and, and, and. So effectively, we do not have that legislation now, and uh, there are measures to, to reintroduce. But what I think is important around professionalization is around uh, reconfirming uh, and make sure that it is properly implemented the values and attributes of a developmental state, especially the public service in terms of Section 195 of the Constitution. And I think uh, those are very critical to be reaffirmed around uh, what kind of uh, ethos and ethics that we need at local level, the minimum competences that are required. We still feel strongly as local government that those are very critical and they must be reinstated. So those that are cited, they will fully agree. But there's no absence of municipalities in terms of recruitment. There's a recruitment policy, there's people involved and so on. My own observation, uh, sitting at the helm of, of organized local government, is that if you look at the white paper in local government, it introduced this notion of developmental local government. And at the center of it, it clearly defined the attributes of a developmental state. And one of the distinguishing features of local government is that in, in, in its own construct, it is defined as involving the community, the administration, and the political arm. And all of those needs to intersect in such a way that we are able to involve communities in the affairs of the municipality. But if you look at legislation that was passed after the White Paper in local government in 1997, essentially they only enforce one component, the participatory democracy in terms of how people will choose leaders <coughs> and uh, also on the municipality, on the consultative part when you develop planning, integrated development plan. But essentially, we have not effectively maximized the involvement of communities in the affairs of municipality. And when you look at issues of recruitment, perhaps we need to go far beyond emphasizing the government part and deal with the governance, which then goes far beyond uh, 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 how we are 
managing institutions. For instance, recruitment processes in municipalities. Communities are very critical stakeholders. But in the current provisions that we have, you'll find that they're not enjoyed in that process. And it would go a long way in uh, creating the level of transparency and accountability and monitoring by communities. So communities are disengaged. They only uh, react on the basis of service delivery. If, if you've been talking about, you say that there are recruitment processes and standards in place, and part of the issue is that communities are not involved, which might actually strengthen uh, the recruitment process. So what is government doing, or local government doing, to resolve the abuse uh, of appointment powers, mechanisms of proportionary suspension, and issues of golden handshakes? Because if you're saying that there are policies in place, and yet these are the issues we're seeing uh, playing out on the ground, what is leading to these issues? I think what, what is uh, glaring is, a, is, is non-implementation of consequence and accountability. Consequence management. If you look at the report of Water General for last year, only 48% of municipalities implemented consequence management. That's less than 50%. Ideally, the Salga would want to see 100% of that. So there should be measures in which we can enforce consequence and accountability at the multiple level. Firstly, in municipalities, you've got oversight structures. You've got municipal public accounts committees. You also have uh, performance committees in terms of uh, assessing annual report and so on. But evidently, you don't see greater numbers of people who are causing municipalities uh, uh, a lot of harm from an image and reputation being held accountable. And you also have measures in terms of provincial MECs and treasury, <laughs> only at the level of report, receiving reports. So you need a council that is much more uh, providing leadership, so to speak. And I think there are measures where we can incentivize and disincentivize uh, wrong behavior. If I had time, I could cite some of the examples that I think could um, uh, somehow revolutionize the issue of consequence management and accountability and performance in municipalities. Okay, so staying on the issue of appointments and removals, if we turn to the criminal justice system, Deputy Minister, how do you think or what mechanisms do you think are necessary to balance the integrity of the appointment and removal processes against presidential and ministerial prerogatives to effect appointments? So you did go into two exceptions where you know there was uh, there were committees that were able to assist in recommending appointments, but how do we balance uh, that prerogative against um, against the integrity of appointment and just make sure that there is little uh, political interference in that regard? Um. I'm not sure when you talk about little political interference when these are political <laughs> appointments. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it is also the question of, well, who in society should take the decision? And generally it would be your elected legislature has authority, and then the people in our constitutional dispensation that have been elected, well, the president by that, uh, by that legislature, by the National Assembly, uh, then having the power. But I think, look, I, I, I'm, as I said, I, I think this is an important issue to debate. I've been to one other uh, such forum with uh, Judge Pickler being present with the uh, Helen Sisman Foundation, and I think the discussion needs to, to carry on. I, I think an important element for me is, is transparency uh, and uh, people able to see what's happened, to know who is, is around or who's, who's being looked at. Uh, to be able to comment, to make, uh, to raise problems. Um, I, I think that was done with the uh, the, the, the appointment of the uh, national, uh, the NDPP. So I think those are important elements. And then ultimately, a, a in that case, a list of five names given to the president to uh, select somebody or one person. Um, I think that, as I said, was, was, was best practice. I want to just draw, bring up the public protector, which is not one of the issues that the paper covers. But the appointment, and um, uh, in terms of my position, obviously I've got to um, uh, um, 
choose my words carefully and not, uh, not upset um, existing people or whatever. Um, but, but with the appointment of the current public protector, uh, there was a very transparent process. Uh, there were complaints, I mean, Parliament or the National Assembly is in the process of appointing a new uh, deputy public protector. There's been some useful engagement with, uh, with civil society on the process. Uh, the Justice Committee is hopefully meeting as we speak to uh, take one of the points on board, which was to uh, have a clear uh, selection criteria, because that was one of the complaints from, from the previous uh, person. Uh, but that was a, a process of which was very transparent. Um, uh, I think the issue was um, there wasn't great happiness um, from from many quarters uh, relating to to the person or, or the, the conduct of, of the current public protector. Let me sort of leave it like like that. Um, so that has its 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 drawbacks. Um, but let's look at the appointment process for the. Uh, Deputy Public Protector, that will then go to the National Assembly. I do think we've got to examine the role of the National Assembly or Parliament uh, because whilst it is the legitimate representatives of the people of South Africa, the elected representatives, um, parliamentary roles in appointments and removals, um, it, it ends up getting politicized. So, for example, um, the, the process well, the, 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 there's an issue before Parliament relating to the removal of the current public protector. Um, the, as, as I understand it, the uh, Parliament is, is looking at rules to appoint a panel to try and e evaluate the issues factually. If, and I think that's important because if it were left up to the committee, it would become political uh, infighting uh, between political parties. Um, uh, but... Uh, yeah, Parliament, Parliament has its limits, although it is the, it is the, uh, the one place that can legitimately speak on behalf of the people of South Africa. So we heard this morning how um, <coughs> key figures uh, tend to be removed from institutions, heads of institutions, <coughs> where, you know, state capture and corruption has taken place, but we haven't really touched on those who remain within uh, criminal justice institutions, for example, so senior management, middle management. What is being done currently to confirm that those who remain within the system who have either witnessed um, corruption or state capture or have participated in state capture are fit and proper for their jobs, um, given that this layer is one as I said, who's witnessed state capture taking place or participated in it? Well, obviously there has to be a proper due process uh, relating to removing uh, anyone. Uh, that's in terms of a labor, the Labor Relations Act. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, if there are allegations against a person that would have to be put, um, would have to be a disciplinary hearing, uh, let me just though say that if you look at um, two uh, current removals that are not completed, um, uh, and that is the one of the acting uh, national directors, Anand Mogojiba, and then Lawrence Mkwebi, who's a director of public prosecutions. Um, the Act, the law, the NPA Act sets out a similar process for the for the removal of a national director. Uh, the president has to set up an inquiry. Uh, and then after considering the, um, uh, the, out the results of that inquiry, then can take a decision. And the National Assembly can then vote to decide to restore that person to office. Now, in the case of both of them, um, or the, the, I, I think I did see in the, um, in the paper that there was a proposal that Parliament should, um, should approve the removal. Uh, which is not the situation at the moment, it's, it's the Parliament can restore them. So effectively, the two uh, people that I've, I've mentioned, um, since the President took the decision, have been out of a job, have not been paid. Uh, if it were that Parliament had to confirm the removal, they would have probably stayed in office and continued to be paid. Um, the reason it hasn't been resolved is because there was a court application uh, by um, Ms. Jeeva, 
um, to try and stop the process which, uh, of which there was judgment, uh, was it earlier this week, I lose track of time, earlier this week or, or, or end of last week, earlier this week I think, wasn't it Monday, but anyway. Um, but yeah, so, so the more, you know, the more complicated you make the process, the more difficult it is to remove someone. So effectively there you've got two people who whilst they're not being paid, those jobs can't be filled. Um, and until the parliamentary process is, is completed. Because the, 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 the medium term expenditure framework and strategic uh, MTSF outlines a much more longer horizon. That could allow municipal to have negotiated you know, uh, agreements uh, very clear on a multi-year basis, especially on strategic infrastructure like Britain. Okay, all right. So can I just ask that maybe we take a couple of questions from the Okay, give me the mic so that I can talk. I'll be quick. <laughs> no, but this person has Position is nine tenths of the law. Please keep your questions. I will. I will. Um, I've already had half the question discussed with uh, Deputy Minister Jeffries already over lunch about the traditional leadership system and the TKLB. I'm just wondering why there's an empty chair in the middle and why isn't there somebody from where 17 billion people of South Africa live in the rural areas under traditional jurisdictions not present when we start talking about state reform. Now, I just want to throw out an idea, Minister. I'm delighted to see you have a diploma in environmental law. Maybe we can have some common ground. Why don't we empower traditional leaders to serve as part and parcel of environmental governance rather than criminal prosecution in terms of what the, uh, the traditional courts bill was. And in the context of global climate change and the deep crisis that we face, there could be there are already made infrastructure for deep adaptation imperatives of resilience, restoration, relinquishment, and reconciliation. That's where people are vulnerable. That's where you can do it. Why? So let's think out the box. Please take back to Parliament a suggestion that we must stop thinking of them as state functionaries in that narrow legalistic sense. They could be an invaluable resource to helping the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Peggy Pele and I'm with Johannesburg Against Injustice. Just a quick question to um, Salga. You have said that consequence management appears to be missing at a local government level. So my question is, what is your approach to the recycling of delinquent councillors, mayors, etc., uh, as a means of you know being used as a consequence? Uh, quick word um, on privatization <coughs> and tenderpreneurship. I mean, the cancer of corruption is facilitated by the system. Why doesn't the state, local government, take over 90% of the functions of local government instead of outsourcing them, where we know that there's a massive gap which opens it up for corruption. So Pansy privatization, Pansy. Thanks. Uh, just two quick ones. The one is to trace and our team when they talk of procurement. I mean, we all know that most of the procurement is between government and the private sector. 
um, that there is a corrupter and a corruptee, and the report is glaringly silent on any recommendations with regards to the private sector with, in a participant in state capture. So I just want to find out about that. Um, is there no intention to also try and regulate what goes on with the private sector? And then to to the Deputy Minister, I'm, I feel for his position, and he obviously has to be careful, but I do want to know his impressions around, you know, after these numerous failures in court hearings of the current public protector, do you feel it is justified to investigate her fitness for office, or do you think it is not justified and that it's all chant? Mm. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Richard Cesar, the chairperson of the Public Service Commission. Okay. To Tracy and the team, just a short message. Um, the National Planning Commission, the, Pub the Department of Public Service and Administration, and also the Public Service Commission are discussing these matters of appointments and uh, recruitment in the public service and professionalization. Let's meet and talk. Hi, thanks. I introduced myself earlier. I'm Nikki Prince, state capture activist. I also spent 10 years in the National Treasury where I worked on infrastructure and um, procurement. I just ask you a question in relation to the procurement reforms. Um, when you've got Anosh Singh and Brian Malefi who are hell-bent in using their management powers to manipulate the procurement systems of Transit and ESCOM, which were fairly sophisticated, um, how, which one of those reforms do you think would have stopped them? Um, we're right, happy. Um, yeah, look, um, a lot of it is is well. I, let me just start with uh, traditional courts, Bill. I mean, it's not. It's regulating traditional courts, and it's it's only um, halfway through the process. It's still got to be considered by. The National Council of Provinces, and that means all the provincial legislatures. So, uh, John, I was a bit um, surprised at your criticism or your um, uh, of it, but they're not criminal courts. They they basically traditional courts. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I think on the the question specifically on the public protector. Um, let me answer it this way: um, where there are serious complaints it's better that they are engaged with. Uh, so yes, there have been problems with, with a number of her um, uh, reports and remedial action. Um, I have to put this plug that I've never, I've, I've never supported the idea that the remedial action of the public protector uh, should be binding precisely be well, because it, I feel, gives too much power to one person. Uh, so I do think it's it's good that the, those issues need to be uh, to be looked at as to um, uh, whether um, the person should still hold office or, or not. I do think we've got to look at other. We've got to look again at this question of the binding nature of the remedial action, um, uh, and should we legislate on that? The court the court ruled on it in terms of existing legislation, uh, but but that's something to look at. The role of the deputy public protector. I think it's an omission that there isn't a requirement uh, that the Deputy Public Protector has to go through all the reports or be involved in the finalization of all the, all the reports. Um, but let me just say that, that uh, as far as, because I think the, the purpose of the discussion was, was, was the papers, I do think we need to engage on it. Um, uh, the, the missing person, by the way, is my counterpart in, in, in finance, so I think that there would have been more input on procurement issues uh, if, if he, uh, had been able to attend. Uh, but one of the aspects you're not looking at is the process of appointment of the state-owned enterprise boards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so that, that's one area. But then another side of the coin is, is also the issue of ministerial responsibility and ministerial accountability. Uh, particularly when it comes to the public service, you've got a person appointed as minister 
uh, by the, the president. They have to account to the president, to parliament and the public. And if they don't have a proper role in the appointment of the senior officials, can you actually hold them to account? One of the problems of the role of parliament uh, that, that came out uh, in, the, in the first term was that these bodies are accounting to parliament. Uh, if parliament actually effectively appoints people, not the ministers, uh, then um, can the minister, is that fair on the minister? So do look at the issue of, of uh, executive accountability. And then also, just with the issue of panels or whatever, or, or committees to appoint, who appoints those people? Um, in the best, the, 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 the um, uh, good case scenario that I mentioned at the NDPP, there was a problem over the, the panel. They were all men. Uh, the president didn't appoint all men. He basically <laughs> said uh, it's going to be the chair of the Human Rights Commission, the, uh, uh, who was a man. It's going to be the Auditor General, who was a man. But he then also said to uh, Nadel, to BLA, uh, to the Law Society, because the Legal Practice Council wasn't in, in, in effect, uh, send a person. Advocates transform for Transformation too. send a person. They all sent men. Um, and wouldn't change when they were when they were approached to to look at it. So I, I'm just raising those questions. You know, on the police commissioner, it's a, uh, a, a a retired general in the police of good integrity. I mean, who's going to decide that? Uh, you know. So just look at those aspects. But I do think, sorry, you want to get rid of me? It's, I do think it's an important issue to engage with. Uh, let's continue the debate. And let's be careful of overregulation. Thanks. No, thank you very much uh, on, on that point, uh, the Minister, on overregulation. Uh, we are seeking a local government with what we think is overregulation. We currently have 76 uh, laws that, and regulations that are all directed to local government. Comply with this. Uh, very necessary, of course, but uh, some of them, we think that there's merit for rationalization and also streamlining some of those uh, uh, areas. On the question of uh, recycling delinquent councillors, <laughs> uh, I may not be able to answer on the side of Salvo because it is purely a political function of political parties that send uh, the, their public representatives on the PR list or a uh, ward uh, uh, participation list. And um, we have seen instances where political parties have acted. Uh, on the sentences. Perhaps it's the critical mass of making sure that this can be done quite regularly, but it's clearly a function. What we do, we receive uh, counselors uh, as, as some for purposes of training and whatever, but we are unable, we don't have the power to say remove this person uh, around those areas. So in reality, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a call to political parties to manage those uh, particular areas. At a municipal level, it's only in respect of code of conduct. When a councillor has transgressed, there's provision on what needs to be done by the speaker to make sure that, <coughs> that conduct is properly investigated uh, in line with the code of conduct. On the protection of uh, municipalities, why do we have outsourcing? There's a range of capacity, both national, provincial, and local. And it's quite more severe at local level because of size of municipalities. I mean, we have about uh, 160 municipalities whose budgets uh, are less than 200 million. Very small amount, vis-a-vis -vis the, the backlogs that are there to be managed. And of those municipalities, about 60 of them have budgets of less than 60 million. And now 60 million with administration, with the service delivery mandate, it's quite uh, very small by any size. So, there's also this reality at a, at a number of these municipalities that you've got a lot of micromanagement uh, at a political level, original structures and so on, as the report says. Because in terms of state of development in many of these areas, just imagine a budget of 51 million, you'll find that maybe the most <laughs> employer that is there in that locality is the municipality. So it increases the scope of uh, this malfeasance relationship between service providers and administration and council. And that's the only resource that is there. So the traffic of competition for position, competition for resources and battles that ensue out of that. 
I think the point you are raising that it's quite it's quite a a challenge in, in many of those areas. So the challenge is how to insulate the local state. How to make sure that given all of these uh, areas, how to make sure we insulate the, the local state. The last issue on the paper raised was around the protection of employees. They are quite vulnerable, many of the managers. And perhaps one of the issues that the paper could consider is introduction of uh, ombudsman, a municipal ombud service. And we have seen uh, one municipality having it reduced that to make sure that they can be an independent hand that investigate, uh, protects, and also be able to have mechanisms to protect them. This also applies to citizens where they will protest and raise issues. If a council is non responsive, there has to be an external oversight that can also make sure it plays a role. Perhaps uh, uh, looking at that concept and see how we can we can also provide support would be a good uh, idea. Thanks. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to our guests for uh, answering questions. And uh, we hope that you enjoy lunch. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, just if you